Werner, it's great to have you back at DLD. It's great to be back at DLD. Steffi, thank you so much for bringing us here. Um, so we're going to continue our discussion about space. We've, yep. we've just discussed some of the business opportunities there. Um, in a position paper at the end of last year, you said that you thought that um, cloud in space was going to be one of the biggest opportunities going forward. Um, why, why is that? What, what, what role do you see cloud having in space? Well, uh, we have had a lot of customers that are already active in space. You know, if, you, um, if you look at the Rideshare uh, SpaceX launch in February, they launched 143 microsatellites, 115 of those were managed by AWS customers. And, and also larger customers, like, like JPL, the, the Perseverance rover on Mars, um, whether it's the Hope satellite that has been uh, uh, launched by the UE or European Space Agency. So we've had a long history in working with these customers and understanding what the barriers are to innovation in this space. Yeah, and and in, in essence, it's not that different from let's say, well, it's now almost 15, 16 years ago when we launched cloud, focusing initially on, let's say, companies that wanted to reach internet scale, young businesses most likely. Um, and space is not that much, they, they all were forced to actually get massive investments before they could buy hardware and IT people. Space is not that much different. There's huge upfront costs to each and every one of those that want to innovate in space. So, you know, we started to look at that and think like, well, you know, what can we do to take the heavy lifting away? And, and then I think it, it's almost the whole pipeline of it, from design to launch to actually most of these operations in space generate huge amounts of data, get the data out of there, do the analytics. And so that whole pipeline taking away the heavy lifting. Yeah, and and uh, design, of course, we've been able to actually build HPC systems that allow to significantly speed up the design. Uh, you must have heard from, from Boom Supersonic these days. The guys that want to build these, uh, these new super, supersonic air, airplanes, the design of that goes nine times faster now because of cloud, com, com, cloud computing capabilities. But more specifically, so that's design. If you look at operations, uh, we built a, a, a collection of ground stations around the world. And why? Because normally you know, that would only be the, the area where big companies or governments could invest in, and there's just no room for young startups. So they can just rent a ten at time now. And, and so you help with everything, and whether that is sort of onboarding and scheduling time, or whether that is you know, command control, data download, immediately directly into the cloud where you can do the analytics. Because a very significant part of space operations is actually observation getting data back to Earth, and then using analytics and machine learning to get that done. So really sort of taking away all the heavy lifting allows these young innovative companies to start focusing on what they really want to achieve instead of having to do all this work that actually has nothing to do with the applications they want to build. Okay, thanks, thanks for that uh, <laughs> explanation. Um, now, you, you, uh, the company, Amazon, is getting deeper into space. You've just launched a cohort um, of startups that are focused on space. Can you tell us a little bit about that program and what you're doing to help them? Well, you know, as, as always, I think you need to invest in sort of the acceleration of innovation. And uh, we, we've done this um, to really focus on the unique parts of, of space, not only operations, but also the applications being built. So, and, and whether that is in the robotic space, or whether it is in control and command space, or whether it's in the data analytics space, uh, we really wanted to put out a program to help accelerate this kind of innovation. And so we had 190 proposals for 44 different countries. And we ended up with having to pick only 10. Um, that's always very hard, but it's, it's, it's very exciting to be able to drive this. And, and you know, if there's success out of this, who knows what we're going to do after this. And I think, if, I, if I'm correct, the companies that you chose are, are mainly American and European. Yeah, that's indeed. That's the one we ended up with. Some US, Italy, UK. And companies from, uh, from yeah, those the ones in the doctors. What else can you tell us about some of those startups ah. and what they're focusing on? I, it's always fun, of course. I mean, one of my, my biggest pleasures in life is 
being able to talk to these young, uh, young entrepreneurs that are doing really, really hard things. Yeah, and so uh, Luno Outpost is one of them. They're uh, basically building space robots. Bo robots that need to operate autonomously on the moon or on Mars. Um, and, and we are fortunate, of course, that we had already built lots of technology for autonomous robots and, and mining cars that need to operate in very hazardous environments. So being able to leverage some of those technologies, help them get access to the technology and the experiences there, allowed it to build them, for them to build uh, autonomous robots. And, and so then there is a the group of sort of uh, companies in there that look more at operations. So cognitive space, those constellation management, uh, uh, the orbits, those transport and logistics, and there's a company called Leo Labs that basically look at um, low orbiting space, degree, uh, space debris by using phased radars. And so the other companies like Descartes Lab and Satellite View and, and Orbital Sidekicks and NGB are all companies that uh, basically take data that comes from space mm -hmm. and then uh, you know, look for, for solutions there. And whether that is uh, disaster management like, like around hurricanes or um, it, of course there's a lot of work going on in and around space when it comes to climate change. Yeah, whether uh, so satellite view is able to track um, heat emissions from buildings, or um, you know, recently uh, the, the the news that was it, uh, um, the satellites found that the um, was it the ice crust in north of Siberia actually at this moment has a temperature of 46 degrees Celsius, so it is actually sort of rapidly melting. And so the cool thing, of course, about satellites, it's all about observation of Earth. Yeah, and we can observe Earth and things that are going on on Earth that you would not be able to do uh, by walking around on Earth. And there's such a lot of that, there's data generation and moving it. Of course, companies have been doing that for a long time. Uh, um, was it uh, Maxar now? Is, uh, they were and are the largest satellite imagery company. Uh, and again, another cloud customer. They had 100 petabyte in their data center in terms of imagery and, and grow by 10 petabytes a year. We basically drove a very massive truck up to the data center called the Snowmobile, sucked all the data out of that data center and then drove it to AWS and put it in there. And, and so there's, there's these private efforts going on. We have open geospatial data for every researcher to use. And so a lot of the data that's coming out of space actually will be available for everyone to use because it's large research plants. So, um, I mean, so, so yeah. I want to give one more example, sorry. Um, Fire, the Fireball guys from Australia, uh, I think it's Fireball International, um, they're able to detect three minutes after a wildfire is started that this has happened. Yeah, and can immediately uh, sort of contact uh, the governments or agencies that need to, need to address this. Okay, so you've given some fabulous examples of how the democratization of space can lead to um, some concrete um, things that help the Earth. Um, are there some other examples that you can think of that you know would would bring you know, that we can we as the human race can get? <coughs> Um, from all of these new space yeah. technologies. Oh yeah, I think, for example, you know, take at measuring agricultural yields, or you know, indeed the wildfires uh, uh, examples, or uh, keeping track of the health of water supplies around the world. Uh, and so I think there's, there's lots of things, especially around climate change, um, that for which uh, space data will just be absolutely crucial. And so the combination of these very, very large data sets with machine learning and reinforcement learning, um, we clearly can detect patterns that we would not be able to detect all otherwise by being on Earth itself. So impact on society is going to be huge, because it's going to be one of the few cases where we can truly observe Earth from a distance. So as most people here realize, um, Jeff Bezos is going to be going up to space right very soon. Um, are you excited about that? And do you see yourself becoming a space voyager uh, so in some point in the future? Well, I'm very excited for Jeff. I mean, Blue or he's worked very hard with Blue Origin to get where they are. A true innovator at, at heart. So very happy for him. And, and yeah, of course I hope to go to space. Of course, why not? Who wouldn't want to go to space? 
Yeah? And, and thinking about all the technologies then that, if it would be a space, all the technologies that we've built for, for that would be, would be great. You know, IoT Greengrass gives you an environment where you can just run autonomous robots somewhere. And it will be cloud technology anywhere. Who knows? We may launch some, some data processing in the satellites themselves so that you, know, you can do similar that we do now on, on snowballs or snow cones, where in, in remote environments you can basically do pre-processing of data before you actually have to send it out and take action on it locally. So lots of these technologies that we've been building specifically for, um, for space. RoboMaker, another example where um, you know, we have this whole environment with an open source robot OS um, where basically with these tools you can, everybody can start creating robots. So lots of technology will be out there that we've made, and I would love to take a look at it. <laughs> OK. What, um, what, is the, what are the one or two innovations coming out of space that makes you the most excited? Um, again, you know, looking at how can we create an environment in space still. I think it's early days. Uh, there's a lot to learn. We need to launch thousands of hundreds of thousands of satellites, which is going to happen, of course, different low orbit, high orbit, um, and see what are the two other heavy lifting pieces that we can take away. If you look at the early days of cloud, it was all about infrastructure, compute, storage, databases, security, networking. But that was sort of the world that we left behind in 2009, 2010, and now, you know, whether we can do machine learning for you or, or build, help you build mobile applications or analytics, you know, well over 200 services in AWS. And you know, we're all driven by the feedback that we're getting from our customers. More than 90% of the features of AWS is direct feedback from customers. So we're keen on actually getting our customers into space such that we can start building more capabilities for them. And whether that is in space or communication space or here on Earth, uh, we'll continue to drive that. And uh, I'm really looking forward to sort of the coming decade because I think we'll see enormous innovation coming out of these companies that go into space. And we'll help them with that. I'm sure you will. <laughs> Please give a big round of applause for Werner Vogels from Amazon. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.